Alright, Sunday, this is only rock. Armor 3 is not real life. But we sure do like to pretend it is. G'day mates, Merry Christmas, and thank you for 300,000 subscribers, you horrible lot. This video essay is about Armour 3 military simulation operations and how the players within them behave. I'd also recommend you check out my video on radios and why they're beneficial to a game like this, which is somewhere over here. Gonna need to change that as well, one moment. Much better. There are three parts to this video. In the first, I'll discuss why we use certain vehicles, guns, mods in our operation. In the second, I will discuss how to make an operation good, enjoyable, fun. And in the third, how players tend to act when actually playing in those operations. This last one is inspired by Lindy Beige's How to Get Men to Attack video. I'd like to start by addressing the pedants. You're the reason the video is named as such. Armor 3 is not real life, so what? shut up and stop complaining when we oh. use a different gun or tank. Armor 3 at release was a near-future military shooter. We have since then used mods to transform it into Warhammer 40k, Vietnam, World War II, Pre-World War II, Halo, Fallout, Zulu, to name a few. It's the Bugs Bunny of video games. These mods are often awesome and without mod developers armor would not be the epic experience it is. However, these extra toys come with many drawbacks. The actual vehicle might not exist, it may be bugged, it might conflict with another mod, it might be invincible compared to other vehicles of its like. A prime example of this is the Lehman Rust from the There Is Only War mod, which has such a ridiculously high armor rating that nothing from outside of that mod can hope to scratch it. In armor, we do the best we can with what we have, and we build a suspension bridge of disbelief over the rest. However, mods aren't the only factor influencing the choice of equipment in an operation. Our operations often won't feature traditional attack helicopters like the Apache. The reason for this is unlike a jet or light attack helicopter, the Apache and its ilk can wipe entire towns leaving nothing for our infantry elements to engage. It does this because it has the magical combination of hovering, thermals and a big cannon that makes your enemy's day into a rather short one. This reasoning is why we don't use the Titans from There Is Only War, or often even the Lehman Russes, vehicles which on their own can control a battlefield. At the end of the day, an armor unit is a big team, and no one wants to be the guy that sits on the sideline and claps when the Apache guns down yet another group of teenage militants hiding in their father's shack. Everyone wants their moment in the sun, they want to fix your broken body, to evac a squad in need, to kick in the door and personally gun down those teenage militants. So what actually makes an armor operation enjoyable? You may think it's all the funny and silly moments that get put together into one of my first o'clock series of videos, but those videos tend to leave out the other three to four hours of gameplay that are still generally enjoyable for the players. Don't forget that most of us weirdos actually enjoy sitting in trenches and being oh. shelled. There are three main elements to a successful and enjoyable operation. The first is time. The second, realism or fun, depending on how you want to say it. And the last is gameplay. I will stress that time is crucially important. Thanks to the failures of science, people still need to eat and sleep. And as such, a mission maker's job is to take as much gameplay and realism and squeeze it into as short of a time as possible. So what is the perfect addition to a mission? It looks like this, near zero time used, for maximum gameplay and maximum realism. There is only one choice I can think of that really looks like this when you're building an armor operation, and that is using the correct weapon or vehicle. For instance, instead of using a vanilla tank and telling everyone to pretend it's a Sherman, just use the Sherman from Ironfront Armor 3. This takes basically no time to place, but adds maximum realism and maximum gameplay, because the Sherman is behaving like a Sherman, not like a modern tank. At the same time, if you need a bolt-action rifle and the exact type of bolt-action rifle you need doesn't exist in a mod, does it really matter if you just use another bolt-action rifle? Other things are less clear-cut. What about teleporting people around? That's not going to be very realistic, is it? But let's say someone crashes out of the game or a bug kills them. They're not having fun, they don't think it's fair, and while you could tell them they have to reinsert on a truck or a helicopter, or even that they're out of the game altogether, that doesn't seem like much fun. All of those things consume a lot of time whilst providing no realism and certainly no gameplay. So you teleport them back in because teleporting is a very, very small time cost, taking practically no time. 
And sure, doesn't provide much realism, but it gets them back in the game. Of course, if someone dies in a proper way, say from a Kraut giving their brains a stir with his Carabiner 98k, then would teleporting them in be an acceptable choice? It was a fair death. Teleporting them back in removes the consequence and fear of dying, and it even affects the game for other players. Now, it's better for them to come back as a reinforcement soldier. Sure, it's gonna take a bit more time, but the realism gain is gonna be quite heavy. And whilst the gameplay on the way over in the truck might be rather minimal, their gameplay later is probably going to be improved by the fact that they're actually afraid of death. I could go on for a while here, but I think this rather neatly shows what you should be thinking about when planning an operation. Remember, just because something is true in real life doesn't mean it'll actually fit in an Armour 3 mission. I'm talking directly to you, anyone who makes their players walk ages to the objective with nothing interesting along the way. Design better missions, you lazy sods. Now I bet you're wondering what in the bleeding hell a video about people not wanting to die in combat has to do with an Armour 3 game. Well, the video sparked a rather fun thought in my head. How to get Armour 3 players to fight well. The first thing we need to get out of the way is that save for one life operations, players, for the most part, don't really fear for their lives as much as they should. They still do, thanks to the penalties that death has, like having to get a ride with your squad's mum back to the battlefield, but much less than one life operations. <laughs> Additionally, what does fighting well even mean? In this context, I mean working as an effective part of a fighting force, fulfilling their role to the best of their ability, and listening to orders given. Generally, if everyone is doing that, then the unit as a whole will likely succeed. With the mods we play with, armor tends to reward realistic tactics. Most of the time. Literally ineffective against that Lehman Russ. Let's see if this will work, shall we? Eat crack grenade! HOLY SHIT THAT FUCKING WORKED! So, this segment will focus on operations against the AI, where players, once dead, have some method of getting back into the game. The model for this segment is rather simple. Morale, for most Armour 3 players, means nothing. It's remarkably useless and non-existent. Not saying they don't have morale, I'm saying it's not a factor most of the time. Instead, we have something else which is a major factor in a player's effectiveness. I call it order. If things become disorderly, things fall apart. In many ways, this is just the broken windows theory. You could indeed say that order is the morale of Armour 3 players, but there are several factors where it differs. For example, if you told Alpha Squad that Bravo Squad was wiped out to a man, in real life, that would make morale plummet. In Armour, no one's going to care, unless they're next on the chopping block. However, if you tell Alpha Squad that Bravo Squad will be 10 minutes late to the rendezvous, because they flip their vehicle and they can't get it unstuck, you're gonna see a lot more fury from the Alpha Squad players. Again, a little wave to part two, time wasted. So what effect does order actually have? Much like morale, it's hard to detail, but it's easy to observe. When order is high, the mission is likely to move quickly, the players will follow orders properly and promptly, and when contact with the enemy is finally made, things won't break down into chaos. When disorder reigns, people will be lazing about, playing music through their microphones, sitting around when they really should be moving their asses or keeping their eyes out. It delays the operation as people take ages to load into vehicles, as orders are ignored, and people just want to go and shoot things instead of actually listening to the plan. I will say it's entirely fair for players to fall to disorder depending on the mission. There are many factors involved with order, but absolutely chief among them is the state of the mission itself. If the mission is lagging and desyncing and people are constantly crashing, order is going to plummet as leaders disconnect, people get fed up and vehicles rubber band into each other. That is entirely on the mission maker, and any basic operation with a good frame rate is infinitely more fun than a super complex operation that lags horribly. At the end of the day, everyone's making an investment to play along with the operation. If the operation is boring and laggy, why should we play along? On the other hand, if an operation is really fun and exciting, people will look past a few errors and hiccups. If their vehicle bugs out and explodes, who cares? It'll be fixed in 10 seconds and we're back to this really fun operation. In our Zulu operation, for example, we could forgive the fact that our Gatling gun was actually just a Maxim, because it was a fun operation, and it was something that had to happen. Gatling guns don't exist in armor. More factors go into it, of course, such as the quality of your squad and your leaders. A primary trait of veteran players, and, well, more importantly, good players, is how much disorder they can put up with and push through, whilst the idiots start to fall apart the moment there's a 30 second delay. When combat starts, those in disorder will have no idea what to do because they have no idea what the objective is or where the enemies are, and they might even shoot at friendlies because... I'm being shot at, I'm being shot at! Oh, ooh, a man with a gun! 
Ah, that is a friendly space marine. I'm in a lot of trouble. Orderly units will be able to fight on effectively even if their squad leader is killed. And the more orderly your squad is, the more losses it will take before you stop being an effective fighting unit for your commander. To give a simple example, we launched two assaults on a town in a World War II operation. The first was a disaster. The Cromwells were knocked out almost immediately by enemy fire. Second platoon was wiped out to a man by hostile tanks. And first platoon dug in next to a windmill as they were repeatedly harassed by an armored car. They were harassed, of course, because their anti-tank trooper managed to miss all of his shots and didn't have his spares, leaving them defenseless. I ended up having to run up and down the line calling for retreat since all of our radiomen died. Now, why were the Cromwells knocked out? Uh, simple, really. They sat still. Yep, a British platoon of Cromwell cruiser tanks, whose main advantage is that they move really fast, sat still in a field and were knocked out by enemy fire. But it's almost understandable. They weren't briefed on what to do after the initial phase of the attack, and the first tank to explode was their command tank. So try and imagine being in one of the other tanks. You've got no idea what to do. Your commander appears to be having a bonfire in his tank to the left, so you've lost all contact with command. No idea where the enemy forces are. No idea where the friendly forces are, or that anti- Ooh, and the next tank's gone. You're the last tank left. Can you really take on all of those enemy tanks on your- And you're dead too, because you didn't move. The second time, the assault was much more concentrated, simple, and under the direct eye of all the leaders. We led a charge across a field using smoke rounds from the Cromwells, broke into the town and set about our objectives properly, clearing the houses and securing our sectors. The Cromwells, now properly organized, actually used their speed, flying around the battlefield like gods of war, with no enemy actually able to hit them, and knocked out all the hostile tanks with no losses. The difference was incredible. One of the key components of order that actually makes players far more effective is knowledge of enemy positions. Against the AI, and especially against enemy players, simply knowing where the enemy is is often the biggest step in defeating them. If you know where they are and they don't know where you are, you'll probably win the firefight. Often in World War II operations, I'll simply put my Sten gun away and pull out my binoculars to guide my riflemen with. It's far more effective for us to know where the enemy is and point them out to riflemen than it is for me to try and search for them and take them out with my own Sten gun. Not ah! Hero. Two times Germans! Just there! Very, uh, northeast, northeast! Check them! Lindy Beige mentions in his video how you'll often hear of a full company attack, but in the end it'll only be a handful of senior soldiers that actually storm the objective and capture it. This was perfectly paralleled when a rather poor platoon lead was told to take an objective by company command. After ages of his platoon getting nothing done and milling about, the company commander sent his second in command, alone, to head across the battlefield and resolve it. That second in command ended up seizing the objective on his own, an incredibly easy task that thanks to the poor performance from the platoon hadn't yet been completed. The best leaders aren't the ones that know all the fancy terms and military sounding things, but the ones that by sheer power of voice, will and authority can get nine other gamers, disgustingly slovenly creatures, at the best of times, into a line and saluting their commanding officer. As the leader of the unit, a popular figure and a notoriously loud cunt, I'm rather able to get people back into line with a few key words, insults and a bolt around the head. However, if someone just starts to ignore a sergeant's direct orders, they need to be removed from the operation. They have hit rock bottom, peak disorder. They are no longer playing along with the idea that you are the sergeant and you are the private. And it's such a cause of disorder that removal is the only solution. It's about the worst sin that you can commit in an armor unit. It's much like playing paintball with someone who won't go out when hit. It was perhaps for this reason that we found the Zulu operation to actually go incredibly smoothly. Since all players were directly in view of an officer at all times, two in fact, and were either in a line or column together, they weren't able to slack off or stop listening to orders lest everyone see them and their squad shout at them for making the rest of them look bad. Anyone that started to slip into disorder was immediately corrected by the concentrated power of leadership in the area. I have a rather interesting perspective on the situation because I've played at all levels in Milsim for many years, and more importantly, I review loads of footage for each match from the Fuster Cluck series. The footage is not just my own, but many other people in the units. I know both the feeling of being so pissed off with a terrible operation that I've wasted my time with that I just sit down with my mate and shit talk for the rest of it, and also the feeling of being a leader with these assholes sat on the floor chattering to each other instead of getting up and doing their damn job so we can finish this operation and stop playing. In many ways, disorder compounds on itself. People who get fed up and angry with the operation and start going into chaotic behaviours like looting and team killing 
start creating more disorder and more unhappiness within the operation. Something to remember as well is those chaotic, hilarious moments you see in videos should always be the exception if you want armor to be fun. When everyone tries to act out and be kooky and hilarious at all times, no one has any fun at all. Stop trying to be Soviet Womble. No shade on him, that guy is one of my main inspirations and is absolutely hilarious, but just repeating something that a funny person said doesn't make you funny. And before I wrap things up, I want to make it very clear. Order does not mean calling everyone by their rank. Order does not mean saluting every time a sergeant walks past. Order does not mean always being silent unless spoken to. Order simply means that you're playing along with the story that everyone's trying to tell. Getting team killed normally in armor really sucks, but if you get team killed by a commissar because he's executing you, then people tend to enjoy that because that's playing along with the story. That's a narrative moment, that's something you can laugh about and then get back into the game because the commissar executed you as commissars are wont to do. But if you're just shooting each other because you don't like each other, now that's an out of game experience and disorder is starting to fall into place. So there we have it, Armor 3. If you want your players to play well, fight well and enjoy their operations, then you need to maintain order. Primarily by providing them with a good operation with minimal lag, with good leaders who stop them from falling into chaotic behaviors, and therefore make sure everyone has as much fun as possible in the time that you have. It's not real life, no. It's a whole other basket of bullshit you've gotta deal with.